It explains the mystery of how so few American advisors made such a big difference whenever they came under guerrilla attack. Reporters were always looking for signs of Americans armed for combat on the ground. The place to look was overhead. This was the advisor's secret weapon, an AC-130 gunship. And the untold story of its role in this war offers one possible explanation for the Pentagon stonewalling on the question of American combat. The AC-130 is the most effective flying gun platform in the uh, United States inventory. Former Green Beret Sergeant Greg Walker has led the fight for combat recognition. So when you brought a gunship over, that little six-man team on the ground, if you had a thousand guerrillas out there, no problem. An awesome, awesome weapon to give us. Actually, I, uh, I'm a little bit uncomfortable talking about it now, even though the war is over and uh, I'm, I'm retired. It was very, very sensitive at the time. And, uh, Air Force Captain Mike Little is talking about the secret missions he flew in support of the gunships in this RC-135 intelligence plane. There were no guns aboard, but its 32-man crew was armed with some of the most sophisticated electronic surveillance equipment in the world. Here's the way it worked. An advisor on the ground, caught up in a guerrilla offensive, would radio to the U.S. command post for air support. Within minutes, a gunship would be dispatched from Panama. By the time it arrived over the battlefield at 7,000 feet, Captain Little's surveillance plane was often waiting above at 25,000 feet, prepared to give the gunship exact coordinates to target the enemy. And this elaborate system was able to foil the guerrilla's most effective strategy, nighttime attacks. Under the cover of darkness was when they had their greatest opportunity. But these see at night. They could tell the difference between a cow and a communist. We took the night away from them, and it broke their backs. The Pentagon may still say El Salvador wasn't a combat zone. But whenever the advisors got into combat there, the Pentagon made sure the gunships were only a radio call away. Well, quite frankly, uh, if it were up to me, and I was in a situation where I had to defend myself, and they said, you can have this M16 rifle and it's 20-round magazine, or you can have this AC-130 gunship at uh, one inch, uh, uh, 10,000 rounds in 10 seconds, I'm probably out for that gunship. And that's what they gave us, and that's what we used. And everybody was looking for the little M16s, and uh, we had that one in our hip pocket at 7,000 feet. And the irony is that Captain Mike Little was awarded a combat medal for his missions at 25,000 feet above the battlefield. And yet these guys were in constant threat of their lives for years on end and in a genuine shooting war. And they couldn't even get that simple little piece of ribbon. They weren't even awarded to those who fought and died in combat, like Sergeant Greg Fronius. In all, 21 U.S. soldiers were killed in El Salvador. Let, let, let me ask you, Congressman Dornan, what, what's going on at the Pentagon? I mean, we, we can't even get the Army to tell us who is responsible for killing these recommendations. No one will agree to talk to us publicly. And they've been doing everything possible to stop the former U.S. advisors from talking to us. No one on active duty will talk to us. Can you explain it? Well, a wise admiral once told me that when you get your second star, you are totally and utterly politicized. So if you look at the Pentagon that way, that everybody with more than one star is absolutely a politician, then you can understand the sensitivities of obfuscating or avoiding or not being uh, truthful on uh, absolute reality. I've been begging them to just say, you were wrong, and do what all of the people up and down the whole chain of command think is proper and fair to the men in the field. To an outsider getting a little piece of metal or a patch or a ribbon may not seem too much, but in the military culture, it means a hell of a lot. Would it be an embarrassment for the Army if, if they were to, to acknowledge these people? Would that be embarrassing today? I think it would be embarrassing if they don't. And three weeks ago, as a result of congressional legislation, they did. 
family of Juan Guerrero Lopez. Receiving the medal will be his wife. On a sunny day at Arlington Cemetery, combat medals were finally awarded to soldiers who had served in El Salvador, as well as to the families of those men who died there. And what about those soldiers we talked to a year ago? And uh, that thing is long time in coming for us. Anyway, very proud moment. America's a great place. The war in El Salvador ended today for us. If you want to know what life is really like inside an American prison, you have a choice. You can talk to a jailer and get the story from his perspective, or you can talk to an inmate and get the story from his. Or, as we reported last year, you can talk to Michael Markham, who may know more about prisons than anyone else in this country. That's because he's been on both sides of the bars. His title is Assistant Sheriff for San Francisco County, number three man in the department, in charge of five jails, including this one. San Bruno, the oldest in the state of California. He is responsible for more than 2,000 inmates who've been charged with everything from misdemeanor drug possession to rape, robbery, and murder. And he commands a force of 600 sheriff's deputies, even though by law, as a convicted felon, he is prevented from taking the oath of a sworn law enforcement officer. How much time did you spend in prison? A little over six years. Places like this? Exactly like this. He was a 19-year-old part-time college student when he was sent off to the Vacaville State Prison in California in 1966. Inmate B-5427. Strange as it may seem, the man who runs San Francisco's jails is not only a convicted felon, but a convicted murderer. I killed my father. Very long story, but... Um... To make a long story short, he shot his father following a heated argument, one of many he endured during years and years of physical and emotional abuse. Did you think about it before you did it? No. No, it wasn't that kind of thing. Um, but I knew what I was doing. Um, it was my responsibility. I mean, I made the choice. What happened after you shot him? What did you do? I called the police. They took me to jail in Oakland. And that just began a whole other world for me. It was a world of stone buildings and iron bars, a brutal, terrifying, and degrading experience. A private hell Markham despised so much that he made changing it his personal calling. The big problem with prisons, he says, is that even today the people who run them aren't really in charge. In fact, he says, like most jails around the country, this one is run by the inmates. They run the show back there. What do you mean they, they run the show? The, it's not our standards and our rules that people are following. It's their own standards, their own rules, which are based on the absolute worst um, understanding of human nature and expectations about humans. Such as? Such as that the toughest person is going to get over. The most violent, the craziest, the person quickest to cross the line, um, the strongest, uh, the person with the largest click. Um, the person with the best weapons, that kind of thing. That's just going to set the standards inside the tier. How does a convicted murderer end up running a prison system? It's not something you can explain in a sentence. It was an evolution that took years. But it began the very first day at Vacaville when he and other brand new prisoners were marched naked into a shower to the hoots and catcalls of the convicts who were watching. What do you remember about your first day in prison? The tension, the violence in the air, other people sizing us up as we came in, um, deciding who was going to get who, who was going to be weak, who was going to be strong. Uh, and I was terrified, absolutely terrified, doing my, my absolute best to look tough. Did it make any difference that you were in there for murder? To some extent, to some extent, because people knew that I'd crossed a, an extreme social, cultural taboo um, by taking a life. There was a sense that they had to take you seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And there you had killed someone right. already. And unfortunately, there's some reverse honor inside prison, depending on how horrendous your offense is. Um, you know, you're in a petty with a prior, petty theft or a burglary. Um, it's not particularly respectable. Um, 
you've killed somebody, you've committed an armed robbery with a gun, uh, there's some respect for that, um, basic respect for that. It's just an upside-down society with upside-down values. Initially, he thought he could rely on the prison guards for help. He viewed them as potential friends, law enforcement professionals who would protect him. But he quickly learned that they, too, had bought into this strange prison culture. Every day, as soon as the guards locked them down, the prisoners were responsible for their own survival. Violence permeated everything. I mean, day in and day out. Everything you did, you kind of looked at in the context of, could this get me killed? Could this get me raped? Could this get somebody else killed? Did you have a weapon? Various times in my career inside, I had weapons. Um, yeah. Did you ever use them? Once or twice. Not something, and it's important for me to say this, not something I'm proud of. Um, and particularly in light of what happened with my father and I. Um, the last thing I wanted anything to do with was ever hurting another human being. Um, but it became clear to me um, after a while inside that if I didn't show that I was capable of defending myself, that I was going to end up a victim very shortly. To survive, he learned how to make armor by stuffing magazines in his clothes and how to command respect from other inmates by challenging the system. What kind of a prisoner were you? Uh, pain in the ass. Um, the kind of prisoner that I definitely wouldn't want in any of my jails. Um, like, I was probably a handful. Um, you were an organizer? Yeah. Troublemaker? Yeah. yeah, an organizer. Troublemaker for staff, um, but an organizer. He was an organizer back in the late 1960s and early 70s during the heyday of the prison reform movement. He organized food strikes, yard strikes, and other acts of passive resistance. He co-founded the United Prisoners Union and filed a lawsuit that eventually overturned California's law barring felons from voting. I could not accept that, that something this cancerous, ugly, um, and, and dishonest could exist in the middle of our society. Um, just, it was like a monster factory, you know, people literally getting worse and worse and worse. Um, more and more and more violent, um, and then going back out onto the streets, um, and we were calling it rehabilitation at the time. So essentially, you made your mark by going after the man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now you are the man. Yeah. And that was a difficult transition for me. That transition began just hours after he was paroled, when the joys of freedom turned into sheer panic. He took an apartment in the Mission District of San Francisco but quickly found himself unable to function on the outside. I had a role inside prison. I was somebody. People respected me. Uh, staff respected me, or at least were somewhat fearful of me. Other prisoners respected me. I had some dignity. I knew how to function. I knew the, the rules. I get out, and I'm absolutely nobody. Nobody. Um, with no job skills. With I was scared to death of women. I was scared to, every time I saw a policeman, I was like getting ready to get patted down or shook down. Um, just a cop on the beat, walking the street. I was sure he was, he knew who I was. He thought about committing another crime just so he could return to prison. But his parole officer understood what he was going through and helped him get a job as, of all things, a rehabilitation counselor at San Francisco County Jail. The minute I walked in, even though it was horrendous in terms of the fear of those steel doors clanging behind you, on the other hand, I was on my turf again. You know, this is, this is the world I know. He did so well, he kept getting promoted up the ranks, culminating with his appointment in 1993 as assistant sheriff. Sheriff Michael Hennessy is the person who hired him. You could have picked anybody in the country to run this jail, chosen from thousands of people. Why did you pick Michael Markham? Well, I'd worked with him for close to 20 years, so I knew him very well. Uh, I knew his approach was a very good and responsible one. And the very fact that the person in charge of the jail is an ex-offender, I think, sends a message to the people in our jails that society does want to give them a chance to change their lives. But not everyone in the jails felt that way, especially the guards. One deputy told us, and let me quote, it's repugnant not to mention ironic that someone who by law is excluded from taking the oath of office to be a sheriff's deputy is in charge of 600 of them. Well, you know, some of the... Some of the uh, most important people in the world spent time in prison. You can look at uh, Mahatma Gandhi, you can look at uh, Nelson Mandela, you can look at Malcolm X, you can look at Martin Luther King. They all spent time in jail. Markham is the last person who would put himself in that company. He is apolitical and keeps very much to himself. All he cares about are prisons and changing them. So what does Markham's ideal jail look like? 
Well, this is it. He helped design it, and it's very different from the traditional jail. There are no heavy metal doors or bars separating the inmates from the guards. But that's not the only difference. The difference is the way we manage this facility. The staff person that you met who's standing right there is in here at all times. This area is never turned over to prisoners. We control the area night and day, 24 hours a day. There isn't one moment where jail culture can flourish. Um, predators can't rise to the occasion and take control. No clubbing, stabbings, or rapes. No assaults on staff. Except for an occasional fistfight, this jail has none of the problems that plague the other jails where the inmates make the rules on their side of the bars. But the jail's dormitory setting with all of its telephones, televisions, game boards, and other amenities have led some to call it the glamour slammer and to complain that prisoners here are being coddled. I think a lot of people say, you know, the jail ought to be as spartan, as unpleasant as possible. And I agree. Um, spartan, but somehow consistent with the values of our culture and our society. It's real easy to just say, give us more money for more jails and more prisons, when all of us know it's a hoax. Every one of us in this business knows that whether people have done 20 years or one year, we're dumping everybody right back into your neighborhood and my neighborhood. Markham says a jail like this actually costs a lot less, about a third less to build, than a traditional jail with bars and individual cells. And anyone who thinks it coddles convicts, well, they haven't talked to the inmates. What do you guys think of this place? Concentration camp. There may be no iron bars in this jail, but there are rules, lots of rules. Inmates are required to attend class up to 12 hours a day, as well as undergo drug and alcohol counseling. Yelling is forbidden, so is profanity and making racist remarks. Prisoners aren't allowed to put their feet on prison furniture or to watch television without permission. And they're also told when to wake up, when to go to bed, when to wash, even when to be quiet. Quiet time. That's quiet time. Quiet time. Uh, how old we got to sit here? Yeah. Can, can I use the bathroom? I'm older than half the deputies. Then after a while, after you keep hearing it, you be like, F it, man. Yeah. Send me back to the yeah. other jail. Because you get tired, you get tired of just being, them being right. on your back. I'm glad they hate it. It's a time to impose some self-discipline. You're going to clean up the pod. Now you're going to be quiet for a while because you're going to have to do that out in real life. Whether you're in a library or in a job or in a school, you're going to have to get used to those kinds of structures and disciplines. It's part of surviving out there, and that's why we do it. You think the Glamour Slammer is tougher on the inmates than what we saw at San Bruno, jail number three, the traditional system? Absolutely. We take away the glory, the glamour of being a convict in a tough joint. I mean, we start calling them by name. When we start saying, you don't have a high school diploma, you've got to get one. You don't know how to read, you're going to learn how to read. You've been beating your wife. What do you think this means to your kids that you keep talking about? Um, people lose that whole convict persona and become vulnerable people um, who are ready for some sort of help. How many Michael Markhams are there, do you think, in uh, the Glamour Slammer right now? The place is full of Michael Markhams. And um, in some ways, on my my own role model um, and I think a lot of the prisoners know that too and I think it's important for public safety and for those prisoners that they see me and know it can be done and Markham's approach seems to be working a recent study conducted by the University of California at San Francisco shows that inmates who were paroled from Markham's glamour slammer are 20 percent less likely to get rearrested than those paroled from other prisons another set of Markham alumni are doing even better they were given a job, housing assistance, and in some cases, drug and alcohol treatment upon their release. And two years later, almost all of them, 85%, remain free and, as far as anyone can tell, law-abiding citizens. Sixty Minutes will continue. If President Clinton didn't have a problem with gays joining the military, he has one now with gays joining in matrimony. If the Senate decides the federal government won't recognize a same-sex marriage, Clinton says he'll go along with it. But do Stanley Crouch and Molly Ivins go along with it? Here is Crouch and Ivins, Ivins and Crouch. Matching wedding bands, one underwear drawer, Mr. and Mr., Ms. and Ms. Well, Molly, I don't know if we're going to see same-sex marriages ratified too soon. The public feels it's confused enough already. 
but same-sex marriages are actually mild compared to some of what we see on our talk shows. So who can tell? After all, the Supreme Court just upheld the civil rights protections of homosexuals against discrimination. That's the American tale. Our society moves toward greater and greater integration because a free society also means that you have to put up with a number of things you might even despise, like the repulsive imagery of parades in Washington with half-nude women, nipple rings, vulgar language, and the rest of it. Civilized homosexuals will have to prove themselves, which is already happening in the conservative heaven of the private sector, where more and more corporations are providing spouse-equivalent benefits. Is this because they are high-minded defenders of the erotically downtrodden? Oh, no. International competition is just so strong these days that those corporations want to keep their best workers, no matter what they do, as consenting adults behind closed doors. Will bisexuals be next? I don't think so. In those cases, one plus one might equal four. Well, Stanley, I think the Supreme Court was right as rain last week in their decision. Gay people should have exactly the same legal and civil rights as all other citizens. Nothing less and nothing more. Hell, otherwise we'd have to give the gay folks a rebate on their taxes. I don't know if gay marriage would help or hurt the current situation. Don't know has always seemed like a perfectly reasonable stand to me. But libertarians, those of us who don't want the government making decisions about our private lives, think giving the government the right to say who you can marry and who you can't cuts to the bone. Not so long ago, the government would have prosecuted you and me for getting married, Stanley, or even for dancing together. I think most homosexuals are probably born gay, just the way some people are born left-handed. Most of the new research tends to support that conclusion. I don't know about you, but I never chose to be heterosexual. I didn't wake up one morning and say, I believe I'll be straight. Seems like a better deal. You're right about the freak show aspect of gay culture. People who want to be taken seriously as citizens should avoid parading around naked. But there are a lot of freaks in this country who are not gay. Personally, I don't think anybody should have to live in a closet. But I wish we'd all leave sex in the bedroom and government out of the whole deal. If the families of the victims of the Florida value jet crash think they have an open and shut case against the airline, and won't have any trouble getting what they consider to be a fair settlement, they better think again. As CBS News correspondent Peter Van Sant, on special assignment for 60 Minutes, discovered about other plane crashes, airlines don't give up easily. March 22, 1992, U.S. Air Flight 405 crashed on takeoff in a snowstorm at New York's LaGuardia Airport. Much of the jet ended up in Flushing Bay. Kendra St. Charles, was on board. I was burned several times. I was thrown through a fireball once. Um, I was burned coming out of the water. This is a photograph that was taken five days after the crash. Describe the injuries that we see in this picture. I had uh, second degree burns on my hands and my face. Um, I'd been uh, pretty knocked up. I mean, it looked like someone had taken a baseball bat and just beat me. I had the, uh, the broken ribs and the punctured lung that made uh, it necessary to keep me on a respirator for three days. And because of the smoke inhalation, they didn't know whether I would live or not. Kendra St. Charles didn't realize at the time that the pain and terror of the crash were just the beginning of her ordeal. When she decided to sue U.S. Air, things got worse. Her whole life became a target for airline lawyers. What was trial like? Trial was, um, was another nightmare. It was another living hell. It was something I never dreamt would happen to me. U.S. Air had offered Kendra St. Charles $275,000 to settle her case. She demanded more than $700,000. When the trial began, it got personal. They got into my divorce which had been 15 years prior to the crash. Um, they got into my childhood. Um, my father had been dead for 12 years prior to the crash, and they wanted to discuss his drinking habits. What did that have to do with anything? It didn't have anything to do with it. In order to limit Kendra St. Charles' claim, she says the airline lawyers tried to belittle her injuries. These burns 
are what the company in court described as what? A bad sunburn. They said my burns were comparable to a bad sunburn. And you lived through it. What were those burns like? They were the worst pain I'd ever imagined. I'd never thought that I would ever experience pain that bad in my life and live to talk about it. It was horrible. Joan Forshu was also on board flight 405. She was clutching her husband Frank's hand just before the crash. Frank, a surgeon, was one of 27 people killed. He died of burns and multiple fractures. Once it crashed, I never looked in his eyes again. I never saw him again. And then after the crash, of course, just because of, I'm not really sure where he ended up, truthfully. Uh, and I was unconscious, and it was dark, and I never saw him again. In Joan Forshew's case, the airline's lawyers scoured the records and mementos of her married life. They questioned whether Frank had much of a future as a surgeon, since he was 50 when he died in the crash. They would try to suggest that maybe because he had just bought a new boat, that that maybe meant that he wasn't going to spend as much time as medicine. The grueling trial lasted two weeks. Those were very difficult days. I would come home and just, just dissolve in tears and just be sapped of any energy. And the thought of having to go back the next morning and do that again was just very, very difficult. And you were the one who lost the husband. Right. You were the one who was physically injured. Right. You were the one put through all this mental torment. Right. And all of a sudden, it's almost like you and Frank are on trial. Mm-hmm. We were. Oh, I definitely felt that we were. U.S. Air also brought up Joan's struggle to resume tap dancing lessons as something sinister. She had just recovered from a fractured pelvis and burned feet. They had to bring up this tap dancing. Like, see, you really aren't hurt as badly as you're saying you are. And he said, is it true that you are now tap dancing? And I said, yes, I am. And I wish I had said, and I didn't, but I wanted to say, and I'm very proud of that, too. That's the type of, it was a subtle... How dare you recover, huh? Yeah. <laughs> or Joan Forshew's lawyer was David Rappaport, who specializes in personal injury cases. The airlines and their insurance companies um, want to save money. Uh, they don't want to pay out the maximum that would be appropriate under the law. They want to pay out the minimum that they can get away with. Rappaport says that immediately after an accident, an airline will attempt to embrace distraught victims and their survivors, oftentimes sending grief counselors to stay with families. He says it's usually part of a cynical strategy to prevent future lawsuits. You seem to be saying they may be your friend now, but down the road they may turn around and bite you. Yeah. I have uh, sat at depositions where a surviving spouse has been asked how often uh, they had sex. And the reason for that is what? A defense lawyer might say, if we were fighting in court, well, Judge, there's a claim for lost companionship, and part of that is loss of love. And how can we put a value on something like that unless we know how often they did it? Attorney Robert Alpert defended Delta Airlines in lawsuits after the 1985 crash in Dallas that claimed 137 lives. Alpert says airlines have every right to defend themselves vigorously, and plaintiff's sex lives are fair game. There are issues dealing with the subject of the relationship between the decedent and the family that bear on subjects such as loss of society and companionship. You have to attack something. Isn't it generally the personal lives of the victims? No, I don't think you have to attack something. Some people do. Some lawyers feel that their goal and their objective is to bring in a verdict which is either lower than the outstanding offer or the lowest possible verdict they can get. And, and I don't... They, and they get dirty. And perhaps they get dirty. It's the bottom line dollars. And it's kind of sick because, yes, people have died. I'll tell you what the airlines think is sick. They think it's sick that you want a piece of that pie. You want a piece of that settlement pie. That you want that blood money. They propose that the victims don't protect themselves. That's what the airlines want. And you know what? The trial lawyer is the best scapegoat that there is. It shouldn't surprise you that Rappaport says victims do better when they have a lawyer. 
An Iran Corporation study found that crash victims who take airlines to court tend to get bigger settlements than those who don't. In Kendra St. Charles' trial, she ultimately received a quarter million dollars more than what U.S. Air had offered to pay. And Joan Forshew got four million dollars more, a whopping $8.1 million settlement. U.S. Air and its lawyers declined to be interviewed for this story. There are people who believe that when a plane goes down, lawyers like you salivate. You say, here's my opportunity. Here's my Mercedes, here's my mansion on the hill, here's my boat. Let's go to work. It's, it's not true. And Rappaport defends what he does. And yes, people can call me an ambulance chaser, people can call me greedy, people can call me whatever they want to. Um, I represent the rights of people that are hurt, the families of people that are killed. I do it proudly, I feel good about it, and, uh, and I get paid for that. Caught in the middle of this legal tug of war are the victims. And Kendra St. Charles has some advice for the latest group, the relatives of those who died on value jet flight 592. You protect yourself. Uh, maybe don't be as, as naive as I was. No one should have to go through what I did, either on March 22nd, 1992, the day of the crash, or what U.S. Air put me through in court. No one should have to go through that. When someone at 60 Minutes, not me, but one of the old-timers, asked the other day, where is cyberspace, Andy volunteered to go find out. I like to be in on what's going on in the world, so I decided to get on the Internet. Someone sent me this disk for my computer, hook up to a world of fun and excitement, it says. It's fast, just three easy steps, and you're online. Well, I was suspicious. I didn't think it would be as easy as they said. So I asked Joe Wilmot, one of our best computer experts here at CBS, to help me get online. You load it up on the Microsoft Windows 3.1 or Windows 95. And uh, from there, you would start setting up your account. Once you had your modem configured correctly and, and telephone lines working. Now what do you mean modem figured, configured? Well, there's, um... How do you configure a modem? Well, in, in the PC, there are, uh, these COM Personal ports. Personal computer. Yeah. What's a COM port? A uh, COM port is a serial port that, um, you use to hook your mouse up to, a, uh, an external device, like a mouse or, uh, um, your modem. Uh, a printer could be hooked up to it. Um, and it has certain protocols in there that you use these COM ports to, to do certain services. You realize you aren't making sense, Joe. I mean, to me. Right. Uh, okay. Now, what sort of stuff would I get on the Internet? If I did get on it, which I doubt. Oh, well, you can get an enormous amount of information. Well, I know, it. but like what? Um, recipe can, for chicken soup? I... You can get recipes. You can, you can make friends. You, you can... Uh, I have my friends. <laughs> You can uh, yeah start up relationships uh, electronically. No, I have my relationships. Uh, if you were, if we can go downstairs, we have the uh, internet in house. Uh, I don't want to go downstairs. I'm not here in my office. Why don't I go downstairs? Well, I, mean, I thought any average person with a good computer could do this. Well, go downstairs. A... What if I'm home? Well, Andy, the internet is still a house under construction. Oh, Jesus, and we're in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, there were several things we needed that we didn't have, so we went to a good computer store, CompUSA. They gave us their expert, Ken Murrell. Jesus. Now, if I was home alone, would I be able to do this myself, you think? Yeah. If you had uh, what you really need is, uh, to know what to look for. In other words, in, but I don't know what to look file. for. Well, that's it. Bingo. Oh, you got it? No, we're, we're getting there. Okay, now that's the startup routine. Mm -hmm. What's well, called a batch file to begin the program. When you have the disk in and you begin the and you turn on the computer, it reads off here. Mm -hmm. That startup that. program is not on here. What is a web that's again? What, web page? A web page. It's a site on the internet that you can create your own, for example. I could and you have create my own it. website on the internet. Sure. But I can't get into the internet. That's my That's problem. Right. We're getting into it. Now, what does it want? Welcome to America Online. 
I'm in. Yeah. I'm onto the internet. Well, you're, you're here not, to the login. Not, not yet, huh? You're here to the login. But it's pretty easy to get into, is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. once, once, you get, once you get up and running. <laughs> right. When I started, a lot of you probably thought the internet would be too complicated for you. I hope I have set your mind at ease. I'm Leslie Stahl. We'll be back next week with another edition of 60 Minutes. We'll have newly discovered film of the day John F. Kennedy was killed. Does it answer questions about that fateful moment in history? The Lost Dallas Film, exclusively this week on the CBS Evening News, starting Tuesday. When a killer stunt turns deadly. Something more, you've got to stop the stunt right now. Jessica must steer the cops toward a killer. Murder, she wrote. Then, an overprotective mother and a dedicated social worker fight for what's best for a child. Kirstie Alley, Felicia Rashad, the Emmy Award-winning movie, David's Mother, CBS Next. Monday, the summer of hope begins. We can help this child. A radical procedure will save this couple's unborn child. We're here to do experimental surgeries. A controversy that could divide Chicago hope. I care more than I ever believed I would. The critics say it's one of television's best. There are tough choices to be made. More people are turning to hope. Chicago Hope, CBS Monday. CBS News.